Good evening and welcome to the broadcast. Tonight, one of New York's foremost cultural critics, John Leonard. But first, his latest novel, Harlot's Ghost, spins the tale of a CIA agent at the height of the Cold War. He's run for mayor of New York, directed his own film, and was recently named the official author of New York State. Great pleasure to welcome Norman Mailer with us. Welcome. Uh, what are you saying? This is about the CIA and specifically yes. focuses, um, you use it as the backdrop, and you specifically focus on the period between 55 and, and 64. Mm -hmm. What are you saying about the CIA and its role in America, in this country? Oh, I don't know that I have anything to say about the CIA that's brand new. Uh, you know, many people would see the CIA as vastly more sinister than I see it in this. Uh, I think the CIA was the, um, the vanguard, the intellectual elite of, of the WASP establishment in America. Mm -hmm. And I think a great many people on the left, and I consider myself a man on the left, have always seen it as a sort of absolutely sinister, closed organization without inner variations. And as the more I read about it and studied about it, began to feel it. Because when, when you write a novel at a given moment, you pass over from research into having a feel for the subject. Yeah. You shouldn't be writing the novel if you don't think you have a great feel for it. In fact, uh, parenthetically, by the time I, in the last couple of years of writing this book, I, I literally would have to remind myself that I'd never been in the CIA, <laughs> which is what, exactly what you want to do. You, a novelist, in that sense, is like an actor. You, you truly have to get into the role. And you felt like you had inhabited, quote, the company. Yes, yes. And I was a member of it, and I could see it from the inside. Yeah. And in that sense, it's an immensely complex social organism. Now, it was, as I say, the, the vanguard. Uh, uh, it was the intellectual elite of the establishment. Yeah. And I think it's been that, and I think it will be that again. And, uh, will be that again? Oh, yeah, because they're going around a huge turn right now. You know, you know the Cold War has ended. And, yeah. uh, and so the new CIA becomes kind of a font for, for, for information analysis? Well, for a lot of things. Uh, it's going to be terribly important to know who's got nuclear power. Right. Uh, you know, there are going to be so many fragmented yeah. countries all over the world. They're going to have not just the, so the old Soviet yeah. Union and its new forms, but third world countries. Uh, there's going to be a huge amount of maneuvering among relatively poor, undeveloped countries to get some kind of nuclear potential. Almost because it, it, it's almost, it'll almost be like a badge of merit. And so that. information becomes king then, and yeah. knowledge becomes king. Although the I, I, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I, th I think it's going to be a more interesting organization in a funny way. Uh, it's always been vastly interesting, but what I mean is it may be a more purposeful organization. Because in the old days, there was this huge ideological war that went on. Was the Soviet Union the avatar yeah. of evil? Was yeah. it truly the evil empire, or was it not? And you had these, in, these internecine wars in, in the CIA. You had branches of the CIA that were saying, look, these guys are through. Yeah. The Soviet Union is, is, is kaput. Let's stop thinking of them as the evil empire. And you had other people who are absolute cold warriors who said, this, this is all disinformation. They are really much stronger than they're letting us know. For a long but, time, that was Bill Gates, the new CIA director. Yeah, but he's gone in the other direction now. I yeah. saw a statement he made the other day, and I was startled by it because I'd been on the road talking about the book, and yeah. people kept asking me, w which direction is the CIA going to go in? And I was saying, well, I think they're going to have to get very interested in nuclear information. Yeah. They're going to have to get economic information. Yeah. Because now that America has virtually has, has damaged itself economically, killing the economy of the Soviet Union through a mutual arms race, now we, we fall behind the Japanese and the Germans and the French and the English and all that. We've got to get good economic information. Yeah. So that's going to be one of the functions of the CIA. Well, well my God, he was, he was saying the same he's thing. He's saying the same thing. But here's the interesting thing. When you talk to these people, and I have living in Washington, have, as a reporter, I have talked to them, they constantly say it's not the information. We can get the information. What we constantly, problem we have is having the right kind of analysis, finding the right kind of looking and telling us what the information means. Well, there, of course, what you get into are cliques and power groups yeah. and the vested interests that comes from being able to give an interpretation to information. Yeah. But let me come back. Did you want to say something about America in, in terms of, of what they have done to us, uh, what the CIA has done to us? Or was yeah. it just... Oh, well, you know, I don't think the CIA did it to us. I mean, yeah. I think America's gone. Uh, I don't think we're as good a country now as we were 40 years ago. I, I think there's a tremendous amount of damage has been done, you might say, to the living tissue of America. But I, I think the CIA is just one of the factors in it. I wouldn't lay the blame on them. Yeah. I think the corporations have done more damage to America. Uh, well, I'd say that the corporations have done as much damage to America as the Communist Party did to the Soviet Union. In what way? Well, they put up a whole series of buildings all over the country that are hideous, ugly, these yeah. enormous high-rise office buildings that have no character. When you're spending multi-millions of dollars on a building, the least you do, you owe the populace something. You owe, owe them the, the right to be able to look at an attractive building, which has interesting yeah. turns and twists. Yeah. It isn't just a damn 
Kleenex box that's 40 stories high. So they've done that. Uh, we put roads across the country that really had very little meaning. In other words, the government and yeah. the corporations. And environmental damage. Have done enormous environmental damage. The CIA has only done very small environmental damage in this country. I, I mean, they put up Langley, which yeah. is a terribly ugly building, I gather. Well, you, you can't see it from the road, so that's right. nobody knows. Yeah. Um, in creating the characters here, uh, there is a lot written about what you were use, the use of duality. I mean, you have Kittred uh, creating sort of Alpha and Omega, and mm -hmm. people are saying that Norman, in creating this man, Harry, and this woman, Kittred, is creating two sides of himself. Uh, well, do, is always, that you? Well, I mean, they walk around as if, uh, you know, they discovered the wheel. Novelists are always creating male and female characters out of facets of themselves. Yeah. My God, where are you going to create? There are only two ways you can create a character as a facet of yourself or out of observation of people you don't truly understand. Yeah. And any of some of the best characters in fiction of all time come from people you know who's inside you can never enter, uh, who are people who just, you see them from the outside. And, and what in her is your character? What, it, what about her, this character, Kittred, who writes all these letters and, and who is a psychologist, in a sense, at the CIA, is Norman in the way she well, thinks? Well, but I, no, 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 I'll, viewers I'll that pick up on that and they say, she is Norman. She has Norman's voice. She has Norman's attitude. She has... If she has my voice, then that's my lack as a writer. In other words, I didn't get her voice sufficiently over... Right. I always thought she was writing in her voice, not mine. Right. But I must say, Kittred is an example of observation. Right. Because I drew her from four or five women that I knew fairly well intelligent, intellectual, strong women. And she's a composite portrait of, an, of a number of these women. Yeah. And her spirituality, I was thinking very much of a particular woman I know, used to know, who had that quality, which is everything she did had deep religious signif significance to her. Right. So in that sense, uh, you know, if she's in some degree also comes from me, well, fine. You don't want to do a character who's just a composite of other people you knew, if you can enter it too, and yeah. if you can anoint it with your own touch. Fine. And you can do that with a female character. Well, why not? It, yeah. it, it, I like to think that writers can move across gender, they can yeah. move across race. I'd like to believe that I could write a black man someday who'd be enormously convincing. So that you think a black man had written the book, why not? Let me stay with women for a second. Yeah. How does, the, the, you are fascinated by women. Yeah. Love them, are fascinated by them. Have had explosive encounters with them, whether you they were feminist. That. Yes, you could. Yeah. <laughs> Wives, feminists, and others. Yet I wonder if the public perception of your attitude towards women is justified and meshes your own sense of what women mean to you. I want to say something salty. All right. The public perception of any matter is very rarely justified. It's not entirely the public's fault. It's only half their fault. The other half belongs to the media. Right. Have you ever met anyone that you read about for years in the media who was remotely like the portrait of them? Did you ever get a sense with, with a political candidate of the kind of intimate charm they might have yeah. as opposed to the big sense you have of them? Uh, people who write for newspapers are under a tremendous pressure, which is they have to write about uh, awfully complex things that day. Two or three hours after an event occurs, they've got to write about it. Yeah. It's almost impossible, it's almost impossible yeah. to write anything good unless you can sleep on it. Yeah, but they bring to it a cumulative knowledge and coverage of those subject matters all, if they're any all good. The worst, all the worst. Every, all the every, worst? Every false fact that's ever been printed and took on a life. Yeah. You know, I once coined a word factoid. Right, you did. I which remember. means a, a, a factoid is a fact which has no other existence than, it, than that it once appeared in print. Yes. <laughs> and these factoids accumulate over the years. And, and what does a reporter do when he's writing a story? He goes back and he looks through the files. Uh, and so all the old lies and misperceptions come right uh, down back into the story then, and are told one more time. Then tell me what misperceptions there are about your attitude towards women. Well, the attitude is, is that I'm a, a woman basher. It's just not right. true. You know, I love women. I'm relatively, uh, uh, I mean, I wouldn't character myself. I'm, I'm characterize myself. I'd say I'm a la moyenne sensuelle. I'm an average man when it comes to women. I, I, don't, I, I don't hate women, God. Yeah, you don't think I mean, the proof of it is, my God, I have five daughters. I've been married. You don't get married that many times yeah. if you hate women. Do you, think, do, do you like the women you've created in, in, your, in your works? I like the women. Yeah. Yeah, I like all of them. Yeah. I like Elena in uh, The Deer Park. Uh, I like Cherry, who's a rather sentimental creation in An American Dream. Uh, I like Hallie Jethro and mm -hmm. Why Are We in Vietnam, even though she's mad. Yes. Uh, I, I love Kittred. Love her. Uh, yeah, I love her. Yeah. I, I love Nicole in The Executioner yeah. Song. Kittred is, is uh, characterized Kittred then. What is it about her that you love? Well, she's so, she's so bright, she's so beautiful, she's so tortured in a way yeah. I can feel a lot of respect for her. Yeah which is she's terribly concerned with her soul. Yeah. She does not want to corrupt her soul at the same time. She's a woman of powerful passions yeah. and, and, and powerful instincts and drives. 
and she's also a woman who's fighting in an incredibly male world to create a position for herself yeah. 20 years before women's liberation existed. Yeah. And you describe her as looking like Jacqueline Kennedy. Well, yeah, she thinks of herself as looking a little yeah. like Jacqueline Kennedy uh, because she meets Jacqueline Kennedy at one point and is struck with the fact and is a little awed by how yeah. beautiful Jackie Kennedy is compared yeah. to herself. And uh, The interesting thing about this, too, is that a lot of old themes for you are in here. Oh, things some people would characterize as, as passions, obsessions, um, JFK, the Kennedy family, mm. part of this, obviously. Uh, Marilyn Monroe, mm. part of this, obviously. Uh, well, that was tongue-in-cheek. Well, I mean, when I put Marilyn Monroe into this book, because after all, she did not have to be in this right. book, my feeling was they're going to go crazy out there. <laughs> <laughs> did you really? This yeah, is to tease the critics. Or yeah. tease well, you know, why do I have to sit there and keep taking these custard pies in the face? <laughs> Once in a while, I'll encourage a custard pie. At least it's my custard pie. So you're <laughs> jerking their chain. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about JFK? Well, I think there's never, we're never going to be able to write enough about JFK. I why mean, do you he's say one of the that? great enigmas of American life because he was. Cut down so young? Well, he, he's our national obsession. Yeah. That's absolutely so. Uh, we just, uh, we'll never get over his assassination, yeah. or we won't get over it for another 50 years, uh, or we won't until we have some idea, unless we, until we can lay the assassination to rest, which may take three or four more generations. Yeah. And you still have been, I mean, I remember the story. You were always sort of, you were knocked out by him in the beginning because he didn't, uh, it, Naked in the Dead was not the book that he cited. It was Deer Park, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he said it was, it was a good moment because I was interviewing him. And he said, oh, yes, Mr. Mailer, it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, I've read your work. I've read. Yeah. And then for a moment, he couldn't think of anything. And my thing was, well, <laughs> hell with you. If you can't think of any of my books, I'm not going to help you. And he hesitated. For, oh, it must have been a good 10 seconds. It felt yeah. like a half minute yeah. at first. And he said, I, I've read The Deer Park and the others. Yeah. yeah I, thought, well, you... I thought, if he hasn't read it, then he's got good advice. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Gorbachev suggests that you were being had, that it was a con by the president. Well, I'm saying if it was a con, then more, more power to yeah. it. I didn't care whether it was true or it was a con. Either way, the man was obviously either well-read or most intelligent. Yeah. You, uh, you, uh, you create a character, and you put words in his mouth. I mean, a lot of people who read the, the conversation between Hoover and JFK, mm. tell me what's going on there. What, what's going on? Yeah. Well, J. Edgar Hoover has gone to lunch fully armed with the fact that uh, there was a real-life lunch, right. but no one knows what took place. Exactly. That's why I'm interested in it. Afterward, Judith Campbell Exner was shut down from the White House. Yeah. She couldn't call the White House after that lunch. So that's all you have to go on is the facts. Well, I had a substitute character for Judith Campbell Exner named Modine Murphy. So in, in my book, which is parallel to yeah. what happened in life, J. Edgar Hoover goes to this lunch armed with the fact that this young lady, Modine Murphy, has had an affair with Sinatra, with John Fitzgerald Kennedy, and with mm -hmm. Sam Giancana, mm -hmm. who was then one of the leading mafiosos mm -hmm. in right. the country. Which Judith Exner, of course, had. Yeah. And in the course of this lunch, they skirt just about everything in sight. Yes. And slowly, very slowly, Hoover just drops it on him yes. that he's got the goods. And Kennedy sees him to the door afterwards. They're both perfectly polite the whole way. Yeah. At the very end, says, give my regards to Clyde Tolson, who, <laughs> <laughs> who of course, who? was known throughout Washington as Hoover's homosexual love. Um, yeah. Never been proven, but was no, no, suggested never by proved, everybody. But, right. but, you know, Just saying, I, uh, and the they point, lived together for 40 yeah. years. And went and everywhere and together, and vacationed and, uh, together. Yeah, yeah. And your point was that, that Kennedy was saying, that the jo joy of you of putting those words in Kennedy's mouth was to say, you know, I can one-up you. People in glass I can one-up you, you know. <laughs> You better not. But in any event, Hoover, uh, the lunch was really went to Hoover in yeah. that after that Kennedy did shut down exactly. that telephone yeah. link. Yeah, that, that I guess say that. And, and the story is that they put it, that actually went to Robert Kennedy, didn't he? Didn't Hoover go to Robert Kennedy and say, we, you know. Yeah, we, indirectly we, he went to him. I think he even, he didn't go, I'm trying yeah. to remember now whether he went to him directly or some yeah. of his people went to him. But in any event, uh, Kennedy, got, uh, Robert Kennedy got furious and called in a couple of CIA people. Yeah. No, no, I bet, no, it's coming back to me now. It's in the book and I just right. don't remember the detail. Uh, Hoover sent other material to Robert Kennedy to the effect that the CIA had been engaging in a deal with the Mafia. And Robert Kennedy was furious because these were some of the Mafia people he was trying to put in jail. So he called in a couple of CIA men and said to them, in effect, I hope that the next time you people engage in anything remotely like this, you will inform the Attorney General's <laughs> office. And uh, it was one of those, uh, 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 what can we say, ice cold yeah. encounters. Do you mean this to be, I mean, there are some people who write about this book and, and who read this book who think of it and write about it as an epic novel, you know, and even uh, when they talk about what you're doing with the CIA and its role in America Point, you have sort of 
I haven't got, made much progress with. They're talking that, that you are sort of, it is the notion of Count Leo, Tolstoy and War and Peace here. I mean, this is 1,310 pages and the last word is to be continued. Mm. And you can take the story from 64 up to wherever, 91. Well, I'm not aiming as high as Tolstoy. All right, but, but where are you I think he's the great writer of all yeah. time. No, no, no. The next book will probably be about two-thirds as long as this, at least, yeah. maybe longer. <laughs> so that's nine. So I'll, I'll end up with a book that's as long, will be comparable in length yeah. to Remembrance of Things Past. Now, if it's half as good, I'll be happy. Half as good. Half as good. Mm -hmm. But it, I, think it's, it, it, I think it will end up being a book much more comparable, in a way, to Remembrance of Things Past than, yeah. than to War and Peace, I, in that my interest is, I don't pretend to even begin to write with the beauty of Proust's style, but my interest is similar to Proust's. In other words... I think when you're writing about society, the only way to deal with it is as a comedy of manners. Society is so rich, so complex, it's such an organism that you look to find an organism within the organism. And the CIA seemed to me yeah. to be a legitimate organism. In other words, you could not write about it as if it were all a society. It's, yeah. it's not a paradigm yeah. for America at all. But it, it, it is, is an a, organism within an organism. Yes, yeah. but it is a, a lively organism with enormous complexity, its own inner contradictions, yeah. and it's, of course it's what it's got that makes it unique. Yeah. Is in the CIA, they do what all of us do every day of our lives, which, which is. is we lie our zoo off all the time. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We walk well, around. Well, you know what else we do? We, what they do in this book is they talk all the time. And this book is about people talking to people about everything, about yeah. communism, about God, about fear, about courage, about love, about sex. Well, they, they can't talk to anyone outside. Yeah. And yeah. so they do talk an enormous amount among themselves. At yeah. least this is my perception of it. Now, it may be that I'm dead wrong, and they all go around close mouth as hell yeah. when they're in camera, but I don't believe it. Well, I, not only do you don't believe it, my guess is you believe that, that your CIA is more accurate and, and there's more truth here than it is in the real CIA. Than well, no. Well, no. What I'm saying is that my vision of the CIA yeah. would be as good as all but 10 or 20 or 50 visions of people who've worked in the CIA. Because I've had the leisure to look at it. Yeah. Most people who are working at a job only see pieces and parts right. of it. So I've, I've, had, I've had this great good fortune to be provided an overview by being able to read about it, think mm -hmm. about it, without being emotionally involved in every aspect of it. Your harlot is based on James Jesus Angleton. But very loosely, very, very loosely. loosely. I, I, there's no attempt to say this is James no. Jesus Angle, Angleton. Yeah. Angleton. Angleton. <laughs> Angleton. <laughs> Frood. <laughs> yes, Frood. Uh, uh, but Angleton, now there's some people who say that Angleton did more damage to the CIA. He had all those things. He was it loved poetry and, and pound and and uh, a Yale graduate, mm. very much wasp establishment, uh, loved, well, uh, loved lilies, I guess, grew lilies in his garden. Yet there are those who now come forward who are writing histories of him and biographies of him saying, this guy, because of his obsession with communism and a mole, probably did more damage to the CIA than benefit. Well, it's, it's an arguable point of view. Do you uh, share that? Oh, I don't know enough about Angleton yeah. specifically to be able to, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he did it enormously. Yeah. I, just, I think J. Edgar Hoover did more damage to America than uh, Joseph Stalin ever did. I mean, I've said that on record back in 1959. Because of the communism, the mania about communism, or because of the secrecy? Yes, because of this, what's happened is this, this country has been brainwashed the same yeah. way that Soviet people in the Soviet Union were brainwashed all those yeah. years. We've been brainwashed here. The Soviet Union was never in a position to, at least in the last 20 years, has not been in a position to, uh, it was not been an evil empire. It's been a poor, decrepit empire, yeah. which history has proven. Uh, I remember I was in the Soviet he, Union in 84. When I came back, I was angry at America than I've ever been in my life. I, I said, that guy Reagan is calling this the evil empire? It's not even a, it's not even a suitable third world country. They can't make soap. Yeah. They can't make towels. But, but there are a lot of conservatives will, will come step forward now and say, because Reagan said that and because of he did what he did in terms of this arms building. Nonsense. Whatever, it, let me finish. Whatever it cost us, that led to... You know, uh, the, the ultimate deterri you know, the ultimate fall of the empire. You know, when I was there in Because they realized it was all over. When I was there in 84, what you could see is that the economic diseases and apathy of the Soviet Union were 20 years old. You can feel yeah. it. You can tell. You walk into a room, you can tell that room hasn't had the furniture changed in 20 years by the smell of it. Yeah. And the same said the smell of the Soviet Union was old. So it would have fallen at the same time of its own weight if the United States had done nothing. I'll, gi I'll give you a thought. I think it was ready to fall back in... 72, 73, uh, and that Nixon wanted to make the great peace with the Soviet Union. He and Brezhnev were ready to end the Cold War at that point because yeah. Nixon wanted to go down in history as a great president who had made the peace. And I would go so far as to say that maybe the explanation of Watergate was that there were people in the CIA who were absolutely determined not to have that take place, and so they started Watergate in order to get a grip on Nixon. You believe that? 
Well, I believe it as a working hypothesis. I don't believe it as a fact because I can't prove oh, it. I understand it, but, but how serious... It makes you... as much sense to me as any explanation I've ever heard for Watergate, because Watergate makes no sense. Why the Republicans go ahead with it? The only reason they went ahead with it is that somebody had an agenda to make them go in there. Well, the sensible is that Nixon was paranoid about, uh, no, it's about easy, Howard right. Hughes and the relationship and all. That is easy, but that's the ostensible explanation. Yeah, well, all right. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll see. All right, but, but let me just say, do you, what do you therefore believe about the CIA and the Kennedy assassination? I don't know. Uh, it's well, what's perfect. I think when, when Kennedy was assassinated, I think everybody, not only in the U.S. government, but in the extremities of the U.S. government and outside the U.S. government, from extreme left to extreme right, was terrified. On the left, they were thinking, what if the Russians did it? Yeah. What, the, what if Castro did it? And so forth. On the right, they were thinking, what if we did it? Yeah. You, you know, they all knew, they had all been talking about it, not all, but a good many people on the right have been talking about assassinating Kennedy for a long time. But we've got to get rid of that guy. There's a nice guy in Texas we can put in his place, a lot of stuff like that. In the CIA, they just, nobody in the CIA ever knows what everybody in the CIA is doing. So they had to be, I think what went on was an enormous amount of destruction of possible evidence. This is one of the reasons why there are no trails, yeah. apart from all the people who were literally killed after the assassination. And the CIA stuff the, the Warren Commission didn't even consider. Is oh, that, I mean, that, that, that's a travesty, that, that Warren Commission. Yeah. Uh, so and, what do you believe, though? What is no, not what, you, what do you believe? What do I believe? Yes. Who I killed Kennedy? I don't know. Kennedy? I don't know. And, uh, y y you know, uh, Oliver Stone has a very strong thesis in his film, which I don't want to get into at the moment. But, but the thesis but, essentially is that Kennedy was killed because he was going in the Vietnam War. Yeah. I would say that's one of the ex one of the extreme possibilities. I think you you've got to, We've got to keep our minds open to crazy possibilities, which is you might have had two totally independent assassinations going on. One was Oswald yeah. as a lone killer, and the other was some group that had nothing to do with Oswald. That's a remote possibility that has to be kept in mind because very often in history you do get these incredible coincidences where two killers converge separately from one another. They both did not know about each other, so yeah. they were parallel killers, and they both shoot the president at the same time. That's awfully coincidental, isn't it? Yes, it is, but I've always believed that when you have huge events taking place, it's almost as if it's a coincidence you're, you're entering a magnetic field, except it's a human field, where, where everything comes in together. Yeah. That makes as much sense. Uh, you see it in great plays and sports, yeah. wh where people make catches that they couldn't possibly make if it weren't for the fact that something transcendental is going it's, on. Yeah, almost the extra adrenaline push or whatever yeah. it causes yeah. people to be able to do things they but normally they, can't do. Yeah, they get into a place where they normally wouldn't get. But all right, but um, what I think is more likely is that elements of the mafia did it, in, and it's possible that uh, people in the CIA were also engaged. Yeah, because there's some relationship they had because of uh, the Castro business. Yeah, but what I do know is that there never was a serious good investigation. The nearest thing to it was the House uh, uh, affairs, when, when the House, House Intelligence right, Committee right. The, did it. They did not do a thoroughly good Lewis job. Louis Stokes Committee. Yeah. yeah. How about Marilyn Monroe? Oh, I've had an old thesis that, uh, you know, that she was murdered. But by? I, I can't begin to prove it. And by? I, well, I always felt it was done by um, someone who had something to do with Hoffa, because Hoffa hated the Kennedys, and he had oh, this, yeah, uh, I know. In, 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 in this book, right, uh, right. Uh, one, of the, one of the characters in it, in this book, comes forward with that it thesis. Was the, the, the thesis in the book is that Hoffa did it because he wanted to get Robert Kennedy. Yeah. And he wanted to expose him and get him. Yeah, and, and Jack Kennedy. Do you buy that? Well, it makes this sense, that there were maybe there were 1,000 to 5,000 yeah. people in America at that point who knew that the Kennedys had been having an affair with yeah. Marilyn Monroe. So once people in America thought that she committed suicide for 24 hours, and then it came out that she'd been murdered, right. that at that point, then the whispering campaign would begin and it would never stop yeah. and would go... 5,000 people would know it on one day, and six weeks later, 5 million people would know it. And, and that would have poisoned the Kennedy administration. Mm -hmm. Is the reason you love the Kennedy family so much, and you even have said very positive things to say about Senator Ted Kennedy, oh, yeah. and suggested he was the best politician of well, the Well, I, th I think he's off the board now. You, you know, in other words, he can't, he, he's taken too many blows over the last 20 years. So he's no longer a viable candidate. Yeah. But I, no, I think he would have made a great president. But does this go back to the end of the war and your generation and all of that and, 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 and destiny denied or what? Kennedy, you look, at the time, I remember I was very critical of Jack right. Kennedy. All right, why was one reason I was very critical of Jack yeah. Kennedy? Because I never got invited to the White House. I'm, I'm no better <laughs> than anyone else. <laughs> but, but, but after he You was, have your own vanity. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but after, after he was assassinated, I realized that one of the best things that ever happened to American life was now out of it which is you had a politician who was, who was alive, who was alive and could think like V and me. You and know, who and could we haven't had one since then, and you don't no. see any on the horizon? Yeah, Cuomo. 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 A thinker, a writer, a, a, someone who, a man, who loves language and loves ideas. A man who reacts to the given. 
and doesn't have his thought prepared in advance. In other words, what I find best about Cuomo is he isn't necessarily going to have his answer until it's prepared to come out of his mouth, which means that he is reacting to the given, which I think is crucial in any public leader, yeah. that they are open to what the conditions before them are. And George Bush? George Bush, you know, he has this great reputation of being a wimp, and I even had fun with it. You know, the piece I wrote was called How the Wimp Won the War. Right, but right. in fact, I don't think he's a wimp at all. I, I mean, I, th I think he's, he's strong enough. That's not his, his, his fault. What his fault is is he doesn't have a drop of philosophy. He's a man who's full of can't, the yeah. way Maggie Thatcher was. He believes exactly... No, no, not Maggie. You think Maggie Thatcher was just full of can't? You don't yeah. think she had any philosophy? I mean, it seemed to me well, that she had as much philosophy as Ronald Reagan did, and Ronald Reagan is given credit at least for having some some navigation there that guided him. Would you call that philosophy? I, I, think I would he, call I think it he, basic for sure. I, mean, I think he did more to wreck right. conservatism than any radical there. The conservatism of whom? The conservatism of... The conservatism of, of the of, notion, of the notion, finally, that, that you have to, you, that you want less government and you want to have a responsible yeah. economy and that you have to have people who are directing that economy who are responsible to the needs of all the people or else you cannot have a decent, equitable economy. He wrecked all of that. He, he went in for inflated spending. We have more government now than when he came in. Uh, uh, the, the man didn't have a philosophy. He, he had a notion. Well, uh, the notion was more military spending and less taxes. Right, that's right. We'll spend more. We'll, we'll create enough of a, we'll catch up with respect to, to our military might where the Soviets gained on us in the 70s. Well, it was a joke. The Soviets always had a bum military uh, uh, yeah. set up vis-a-vis -vis us. He just knew that if we spent an awful lot of money on the economy and the Soviets try to keep us, they'd die of a heart attack. It, it's like you get somebody, you want to kill an enemy, you get them to run uphill yeah. with you if you know you're in better condition than <laughs> yeah. he is. If they've got a bad heart, you'll yeah. kill them. Yeah, you may have a ruptured spleen by the time you're done, but you will have killed your opponent. <laughs> <laughs> you are um, you are pessimistic about America. Well, I'm optimistic and pessimistic. I mean, the country, I love the country because it's, yeah. it's always showing signs of health that I never saw before, but I'm getting pretty A good. rejuvenation. Rejuvenation, yes, yeah. but I'm getting a little depressed right now. Why? I think something good has gone out of American life. I, I think we're getting near and near to Loutsville. Mm -hmm. I think that this very, um, you know, after all, I'm on public television, public service television right, right now, right. so that's okay. But I, I really think that uh, television as a whole has had a, you know, I, th I think of it as, uh, you know, Mount Television, which does nothing but pour lava down upon the American mind. Uh, I think the interruption that goes on in television is, is incredible what it does to children. That mm -hmm. kids grow up with the idea that they should never be, have to think for more than six or eight minutes in a row because the commercial's coming. Mm. The, you know, the, the, the destruction of, of concentration is, 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 a, is a hideous problem in television. That's a heavy burden, I mean, for television to bear. Yes, it is, but, but you know, that, that, that's what yeah. they want. They want more interruptions. Yeah. Do you worry about dying? Do you think about dying? No. no. Come on. No, I'm, I mean, I, I won't say I look forward to it. No, but are you dreaded? Do you? No, no, yeah. no. Uh, I, I, Are you at I look, peace with I look it, toward it? Well, I look toward it with some curiosity because I know it's going to be different from what I expect it will be. And, uh, and I believe there's a life after death. You do? Yeah. I, I, believe, in re, I believe in reincarnation. Reincarnation? Yeah. It's the only thing that makes sense to me. Yeah. What, what do we have all this extraordinary stuff for if it's not going to be used over and over again in yeah. more and more interesting ways? And, and any notion of who you might have been before? No. Mm -mm. I don't even know if I ever had a life before this one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, some people don't. We, I think we get... New souls come along all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Have uh, you, as a, uh, as a, do you feel a sense of, I mean, do you feel a sense of, I got to spend a lot of my time working because there are things, um, I haven't yet hit the home run I wanted to hit? Well, I, I have no idea. I, I mean, no, you never hit the home run you wanted to hit. Yeah. Uh, Dostoevsky died in misery because he hadn't written The Life of the Great Sinner, yeah. which was going to be his huge book. And you so always, did Mozart died an unhappy man, too. Well, I, I think, you know, I think you always have to keep your sights above what you've done so far. Yeah. So in that sense, I, I will die dissatisfied, of course, because I won't do some of the books I wanted to do. But, no, I don't mind working now. As mm -hmm. I get older, I find it's easier and easier to work, and I enjoy it Easy more. Easier and easier to write? Not easier to write, but easier to put in those hours. And, you know, you don't feel sorry for yourself when you yeah. get to a certain age. You don't say, gee, I could be out doing this or that. Uh, you know, you're are you happiest now writing? Is that one brings you because you're not you've done all those other things? No, writing a book is like being married to a woman you're not too happy with. <laughs> you're worried about it all the time. You want this marriage to be better. It, it, I mean, being married yeah. right now yeah. for me is much easier than writing a book. Uh, when I write a book, it's because like you I'm, were married to a woman you want to be with. Yes, but I mean, but but 
but when I'm writing a book, it's like I'm married to a woman who yeah. I've got to improve now. Yeah. I can just tell you, any, any man who thinks he can improve his wife is a fool. He's <laughs> living in a fantasy by, world. By that logic, all novelists yeah. live in this fantasy world that they're going to improve yeah. their, their little... Yeah. Um, they're, they're literary creation. Writing a novel, you have said, is a gift. You cannot say, I'm going to write a great novel on Thursday. Right. Because you've got to be gifted with what? With, a, with, what? A, with an idea, with a what? Oh, I, th I think at a given moment sometimes, um, well, let me put it this way. I, I think there's a, there's a moment of transcendence that enables you to get into a novel. Because we all are filled with the experiences of our life, but they don't coalesce. And then at a given moment, you can almost feel something physical in yourself, something stirring. Yeah. It's, it's almost like the beginning of spring, let's say, on a winter day. And you ever says, yes, I think I'm getting ready for a novel. And you may not even know yet what the novel's going to be. It very often takes a turn or two as you get into it. Yeah. But uh, there is this feeling. Uh, starting a novel is only really different from starting a book. If I have a book I'm going to do yeah. that's a non-fictional subject, I know that I literally can start it three Thursdays from now, and I can promise it to the publisher with some belief that I can deliver it at the time I'll say on <laughs> You probably won't make it, but... Well, you don't always make your deadline. Yeah. You can if it's a good, interesting book. But you get close to it with a nonfiction book. And yeah. I've written nonfiction books ahead of deadline where I came in ahead of time. I was thinking about Merlin because that was a tr you had a hard time with that, didn't you? No, I wrote that book in two months. Oh, I thought you sort of had to, at the end, you had said before, you had to sort of catch up at the end, at the end where you had to write real fast in order to... Well, that was my fault. Okay. I, what had happened is I started to do a preface for a book of photographs on Merlin. Right. And I got intrigued with the subject. And I wrote at a huge rate and wrote the book in about two months. And then we were going into publication. Everything was set. And then at a given moment, I discovered that maybe she was murdered. Yeah. So I leaped in after the book had been written and rewrote the last couple of chapters. Uh, what I should have done, looking back on it, I should have said, no, no, no. Let's hold up publication for a year and let me really look yeah. into it. I didn't do that. The sequel to this, or the next book, The Son of Harlot, uh, is, is that next, or are you going to write this Picasso book next? No, I'm working on the Picasso book. Now, which, already? Yeah. Already. Which is going to be a modest book. And that's, a no, that's non-fiction, obviously. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that'll be easier. Well, that, that should be, uh, you know, you Picasso's know, not automatic to write about, but, but that should be, I should be able to do that within this year, yeah. yes. In your own mind, have you fulfilled the, the expectation that came out of a 25-year-old man writing one of the best novels out of World War II, The Naked and the Dead? Well, I can't talk about the expectation of others, but you have to... In your own mind. I'm only yeah. talking about you, not others. Well, I, I can only say that after The Naked and the Dead came out, I was scared stiff because I thought, well, I've written this book and I've used up everything I ever knew. Yeah. And well, how am I going to write a second book? Uh, and uh, I went through some tough years wondering if I'd ever have another book that would have any size to it. And now, of course, but you learn how to write all over again and you write book after book. And No, now I would just say uh, I, I'm never satisfied with what I've done, but on the other hand, I, I'm not... Mm -hmm. You know, I don't feel ashamed or feel that I, yeah. you know, I didn't use myself hard over the years. Back to this book. There is a lot here about a young man and his mentor, mm -hmm. a middle-aged man and his mentor, where he even takes the mentor's wife. And also uh, a young man and his father who introduces him into the CIA. Uh, I don't know much about the relationship between you and your father and, and this notion of father-son relationships. Well, that... That father in uh, this book is not at all like my father. Yeah. Uh, my father was an interesting man, and he had his own strong sides to him, but he was, not a, he was not an overpowering father in any way. But is it a theme that... I'm fascinated with overpowering fathers because I did not have one. Yeah. And I've written about that in right, several books, right, you have. about a father who's stronger than the son. Because you didn't have it, and therefore it fascinates you how you might have been different if you'd had an overpowering or a powerful father who had wanted to direct your life? Or... Well, all I can say is it exercises my imagination. I never, I never look at anything that stimulates me. If it stimulates me, that's good enough. I'm not going to <laughs> try to find out where the cellar yeah. is located. What's the great regret about your life so far for you? The great regret? Oh, you know, if I have any regrets, they're of a, a personal nature that I, I just really wouldn't want to get into. Uh, and far, as far as work goes, I don't have any, any uh, mm. great regrets. It, uh, on the day I got married the last time, 16 years ago, uh, well, it wasn't quite 16 years ago, but anyway, it was a long time ago, uh, I turned to my wife and I said, you know, all my life, all I ever wanted 
was to be free and alone in Paris. <laughs> I've written about this recently. Yeah. And she said, oh, well, look, honey, suppose you were free and alone in Paris. You know, what would happen? You'd meet a girl, and you know how you are. Before long, she'd be pregnant. And then you know how you are. You'd end up marrying her, and you wouldn't be free and alone in Paris anymore. <laughs> so I thought, well, damn it, she's right. Well, marry the right woman, you said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Norman. It's a pleasure to have you on the broadcast. Oh, thank you. I uh, hope we can come was, back. This was agreeable. Uh, uh, Norman Mailer's Harlot's Ghost, uh, uh, a fascinating look at, um, at the CIA in which uh, his own literary imagination uh, plays with and, and uh, engages him in looking at uh, a particular period of American life.